Jennifer Yost from Idaho, and she's actually coming to us virtually. So we'll get started there once I have that loaded up. And my name is Jennifer Yost, and I'm a research soil scientist at the USDA Agricultural Research Service in Temple, Texas. I will be briefly sharing some research that I conducted at the University of Idaho, um, looking at the impact of swine manure on soil health properties. And this was a systematic review. Uh, and this project was done in collaboration with the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So to start, as the campaign to improve agricultural soil health has gained momentum among uh, conservationists and researchers worldwide, and also with some producers, a comprehensive assemblage of the outcomes of manure in, on soil health related research studies is very important. A thorough review of all the data um, reporting the effects of swine manure on soil health properties that's applicable to agricultural producers is lacking. And although previous research studies have looked at the effects of manure on individual soil properties, there are a lot of conflicting conclusions um, between those studies. When looking at just livestock manure in general, the livestock manure lit reviews uh, fail to consider the inconsistent methodologies between the individual research sites and also whether research is actually applicable to producers who utilize manure as amendments to improve their soil health, as well as to improve their soil or their, their crop yields. None of these reviews that focus on livestock manure in general focus on swine manure or swine manure byproducts. And when we think of it on a global scale, pork, when it's compared to beef and chicken, has the highest production rate and consumption rate. So it's really important for researchers um, pork producers, as well as their advisors, to recognize the effects of swine manure on soil health. So due to the lack of knowledge on soil health and swine manure, the objectives of this review were to, one, synthesize literature describing the effects of swine manure on soil health properties or in soil properties that affect soil health. And the second one is to identify knowledge gaps in research needs a further understanding of this topic. So based off of what we find in number one, what is missing and how can we improve research going forward? So to start, um, we collected data from a variety um, of different papers and we had special criteria that they needed to follow. So for data sources, we collected papers from Google Scholar as well as Web of Science. And then we collected a variety of data so we have the soil property data, which we are looking at a list of chemical, physical, and biological properties, which I'll actually show on the next slide. And then we also looked at swine manure data. So how much carbon is in the manure or how much nitrogen is there? What kind of manure is it? Is it effluent, solid, liquid, compost? Um, how often is it applied? At what rate? How, how is it being applied? Um, a bunch of important information that would be beneficial for farmers. And of this, there are three different criteria that these papers had to read, um, meet. The first is they needed to be replicated field experiments. The second, manure is the only differing factor between or among the studies. And third, there are data means of the swine amended treatments as well as controls. Um, if a paper only looked at swine manure and didn't compare it to a control without, that paper was uh, left off and not included in this review. So when we were looking at papers, we had three different parameters for search terms. The first one being species. So we looked up whether um, it was swine, pig, or hog. So those are the three main swine terms. We also looked at the manure source. So whether it is considered the manure, compost, the slurry, lagoon, or effluent, or deep pack or litter. And lastly, we looked at a whole range of chemical, physical, and biological properties. Um, these are all the ones that we did. I won't be talking about all of them today. I will be touching on the sort of organic carbon, total nitrogen, um, available water capacity, and microbial biomass carbon. And of um, all the criteria in the search terms we used, in total, we only found 40 peer-reviewed studies um, that were included in this review that looked at soil health and swine manure. So first, I'm going to kind of get into the first objective of 
what have we found um, kind of in the papers that are looking at swine manure and soil health. In this first property I'm gonna show you is for soil organic carbon. So this graph is looking at the percent change in soil organic carbon, and that's calculated by looking at the amendment type and comparing it to the control. So how much did applying inorganic fertilizer, which is IF, um, how much did it increase compared to a control plot of no manure, no fertilizer, and um, if that makes sense. So these are box plots. Um, usually the skinnier the boxes are, the less variation there is with the data. The, the larger the box, like this manure plus inorganic fertilizer one, um, the, the more variation there is in the data set. So as I mentioned already, IF is inorganic fertilizer. LSM is liquid swine manure. SM is solid manure. And M plus IF is a combination of liquid and solid manure plus fertilizer. And um, in these amendment type abbreviations will be the same throughout the whole presentation. So for here, you're able to see that when you use an organic fertilizer alone compared to the control, there is a slight increase in soil organic carbon, but especially when you put solid manure down or use a combination of manure plus fertilizer, you see a much greater increase in the amount of carbon that's in the topsoil um, just due to these amendment changes. Again, this is looking at the percent change in carbon, and this time it's by soil texture. So, of course, soil is a sand, fine is more clay, and medium is usually what we think of being silty. And for here, you can see that of the 40 papers that reviewed, of the ones that actually looked at soil organic carbon, there was no data whatsoever for sandy soils. Everything was either on silty or clay. Um, and for here, you're able to see that there, it appears to be a bit more of an increase in um, medium textured soils compared to fine, but there's a huge variation. Um, so either way, it looks like um, the, the changes are going into a positive direction. Also looked at the changes in organic carbon based on the application method. So whether the manure was applied to the soil surface or if it was incorporated into the topsoil. For here, you can see that there's not much of a difference. Um, for at least carbon, it doesn't seem to matter whether you put it on the surface of the soil or you actually incorporate it into the topsoil. And lastly, we look to see if the duration of manure application did anything. So for here, you can see that when it was applied for less than five years, um, there wasn't a, a great change in organic carbon. It actually stayed pretty similar to what we found in the controls. And um, the one nice thing is, is if you look at this graph, especially with 30 to 40 years, we do see a positive trend. So the longer that you're applying manure to your field, the more benefits you're going to have in in a change in organic carbon, um, kind of building up your carbon. I also wanted to briefly talk about our findings for total soil nitrogen. So for here, instead of it being total carbon, we're looking at total nitrogen. Um, the amendments are the same. So you have the inorganic fertilizer, the liquid solid, um, swine manure, solid manure, and manure plus fertilizer. And similarly to the carbon, um, you're able to see that when amendments are added to the soils, the overall nitrogen levels um, in the topsoil um, do seem to approve, especially when you have manure and fertilizer being applied. When looking at uh, the total nitrogen by soil texture, again, we didn't have any studies that looked at a sand. Um, however, you can see that especially when you're looking at a, a, a fine textured soil like a clay, there's just a lot more variation on how much total nitrogen actually increased when manure was applied. Similarly, um, we looked at whether um, how it differed between the surface and incorporated. And for unlike the carbon, which didn't really seem to matter whether it was surface applied or incorporated into the topsoil, it seems like total nitrogen tended to be higher um, when it was incorporated into the topsoil. And one thing that we noticed is wasn't only total nitrogen is that a lot of these papers didn't really specify how long the manure was being applied. So for here, you can see that the few papers that actually had total nitrogen data, all we have is data for manure that was applied for 10 to 20 years, but we can kind of expect kind of like total or soil organic carbon that the longer you apply 
um, swine manure to the soils, the, the higher the um, total nitrogen is going to be. So for the physical and the chem or the physical and biological properties, I'm going to be showing them in table form. And that's solely because we only we had very few papers. Um, a majority of the papers from this review only looked at chemical properties. Um, so for here, you're able to see that there are only uh, six papers that looked at physical properties. You can ignore the references. Um, this column right here is looking at the manure type. So whether it would, if LSM, which is liquid swine manure, compared to just fertilizer or solid manure, um, you're able to see kind of the differences um, in how much it changed. So for here, we're also looking at uh, the application method, method. So whether it was incorporated, injected, um, surface applied, how this data was calculated. So what was the control? Was there fertilizer that was automatically there or was there no amendment? In this case, for all the physical properties, we didn't have an amendment um, for the control. And then we also looked at the location, the duration, and the soil texture. So very similar to what we were doing for the chemical properties in the graphs. And so for here, um, you have FC, which is field capacity, which is commonly thought to be 33 kPa. We have permanent wilting point, which is PWP. So that's um, the driest the soil can be that the um, before wilting starts to occur. AWC is just the difference between field capacity and permanent wilting point. So this is what we call water holding capacity or available water capacity. And KSAT is uh, similar to infiltration. It's a saturated hydraulic conductivity, and it kind of just shows how quickly um, water can drain through the soil. So of these six papers of the 40 that included or that were included in this review, only one paper actually looked at field capacity and permanent wilting point to see if there were differences in those manure plots when compared to the control. And for here, you can see that when there's about 15% carbon being added to the soil, you see a much greater increase than when only 4% carbon was being applied to the soil. Out of these six papers too, only two of them looked at saturated hydraulic conductivity. Um, but either way, especially in these sandy loams, we do see an increase when carbon is being applied. And this is usually because um, sandy soils typically have a very low carbon concentration to start with. One thing to point out in available water capacity, most of these studies showed improvements, but also when you look at the big improvements, um, like down here, it was on a sandy soil. So sands would benefit from having extra carbon additions um, applied. But for here, you can see that with a silt loam, um, which is the soil one, you can see that it negatively impacted the soil physical property or the, the overall available water capacity in these soils. And the, the thought process on that is just these soils could already be carbon saturated. So adding the newer um, may not be the most beneficial thing, but it's really going to be dependent on your soil type. So this table is set up the same exact way as the physical properties. I'm looking at microbial biomass. So you have microbial biomass carbon um, in, in this column right here and then microbial biomass nitrogen. You're able to see that of um, the studies that looked at the microbial biomass component, only two of them focus on nitrogen. Um, in most cases, they seem to increase when you had an ink or when manure was applied. And overall, when you're looking at the microbial biomass carbon, um, these soil or the microbes tended to be a lot happier and in, in more abundance. Um, when there was an additional carbon source being added into the soil. So that those um, figures and tables kind of more showed um, what we found for objective one. These next couple slides is focusing on the second objective. So what is it we learned from those tables and graphs and what um, should be the focus of future research? So to start, soil health properties are interrelated, yet only one study actually evaluated the impact of swine manure on all relevant soil health properties. So of all 40, only one paper looked at the chemical, physical, and biological properties with swine manure. And because of this, um, we came up with some suggestions of what should be included in future soil health and swine manure studies. We think that the following soil health information 
would be beneficial um, to any um, research project. We think that it's important to include initial soils data. Some didn't say what it was at time zero. All it did was compare what it looked like after amendments were applied to the soil. It would also be nice to know what methods were used to analyze properties such as soil carbon, um, soil pH, uh, microbial biomass carbon, and have a range of chemical, physical, and biological properties, even if you're only doing one of each, to really get a sense of how your soil health is being changed based off of the uh, swine manure applications. And ideally, whatever properties you plan to analyze with your treatments should also be analyzed at the start, so before anything was even applied, to really see how much it's benefiting or how much swine manure is benefiting um, the soil. One thing that was lacking was a detailed description of the swine manure that was used in the study. One thing we really wanted to do was try to calculate the total amount of carbon that is not only being applied, but is also in the soil. And just due to a lack of bulk density, and, and even just to a, a lack of total carbon data of the manure, that wasn't something we were able to do with this data set. So knowing what type of manure it is, how often it's applied, at what rate, um, more detailed description of the manure, like what's the total carbon, what's the total nitrogen, how long is this manure applied for, and when is it applied? These are all very important things that we think should be included in any future research um, papers when it comes to, to swine manure and soil health. And then also for the inorganic fertilizer side, it'd be nice to know What's the application rate of the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium? What kind of nitrogen is being applied? Um, how long is it being applied for? That was one thing we sometimes struggled to find um, in these papers. And also, um, when do you typically put down um, the inorganic fertilizer? From this, we kind of came up with three potential research ideas um, that we think are, would be a valuable or valuable data sets kind of have. Um, the first one would be to balance nutrient applications of um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium to compare the effects of manure to inorganic fertilizer on crop yield and soil health. So that's essentially trying to apply the same amount of manure or same amount of fertilizer as you would manure to see if there are any benefits from having manure being put down at the same rate as the fertilizer. Second would be to focus on the short and long-term impacts of just a single application of manure to support the effort to identify the optimum frequency of application and for improving soil health. So obviously farmers and producers that are really close to um, swine facilities are going to have a much easier time applying swine manure on a more frequent basis. Um, but farmers who may only want to use swine manure once every few years, we really need more research to figure out how often um, we should really be applying swine manure um, to improve soil health. I know there are projects going on right now that's doing this with dairy manure, um, but it's something that's lacking for swine. And lastly, we need to further our discussion uh, relating research findings to management decisions uh, that are relevant to agricultural crop producers. I'm not saying this about all research, but some studies, what they're using for amendments may not be something that's applicable to what's actually going on in their area. So I think trying to develop projects that are using a similar amount of fertilizer, um, similar amount of manure that other farmers in the region might be doing uh, would be beneficial. So I'd like to say thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Our funding came from the National Pork Board. Um, I have my contact info as well as the citation um, since this review was published actually about a month ago in the Soil Science Society of America Journal. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you may have uh, during the Q&A session. Thank you.